Welcome. I am so glad that you jumped back into the next lecture for this particular course. And the topic for this portion is people. All right. People make up the practice of law for better or for worse. And understanding how to manage people is pretty critical in understanding how to manage a matter. And here we are. This is the second major tool that you are going to learn how to use in the livable law method. And of all the tools, it is probably the most impactful, the most effective, the most life-changing tool you will ever get to implement. So listen up because this is truly how I'm going to change your life. A scrum is a meeting. That is a life-changing, game-changing tool. A scrum is a 15 minute meeting. It takes place every single day, five days a week, at the same time, every day. It will take up to nine people. You cannot do it with more than nine people and it will become obvious why. And I will tell you what to do if you have more than nine people. But it is nine people maximum. It lasts 15 minutes. When I say that it lasts 15 minutes, I mean it. In fact, people are encouraged to stand during um, scrums. They're also called stand-up meetings because at 15 minutes, everybody says, we're done, bye, and that's it. You get off Zoom, you get off Teams, you get off your video chat, you walk out of the room, doesn't matter. 15, no more. It, every person gets 90 seconds total. Now, are you there with a stop clock? Well, I would encourage it, but I know not everybody is pedanting as I am, and I will agree and allow for certain you know, deviations in your behavior. But 90 seconds. I mean, you will know more or less if people are going over that. And during the scrum, each person uses those 90 seconds to cover four topics. Now, before I jump into those four topics, I want to talk about the roles in the scrum because then it'll make sense about how we maintain order. There are three roles in the scrum. There's the scrum master, the matter owner, and the team. Now, the scrum master doesn't have to be the same person at every single meeting. And in fact, I would encourage you to have two or three people who can be scrum masters because that way, if one of them's sick or the other one's busy or whatever it may be, um, they, somebody else can take over. The scrum master is basically just the person who's going to run the meeting and keep everybody to the rules. Then you're going to have the matter owner. Now the matter owner, right, is the person who makes the strategic decisions. The classic matter owner is the partner in charge. It can be the junior associate. It can be the senior. So it can be whoever it is who is in charge of that particular matter, who is the final decision maker, who makes the strategy decisions for that particular matter. And then you have the team and the team is everybody else. And if you remember when we started in my previous lecture, the scrum master is the person who governs the how. The matter owner is the person who governs the what. And you can have several matter owners, but you can only have one scrum master per meeting. Okay, now we know the rules. How do you assign the rules? Well, matter owner and team assign themselves, but scrum master, you need to find somebody who can enforce the rules. And it is better if it is not the matter owner, because the matter owner and the scrum master, in the same way that the how and the what, are going to be in tension with each other. Because the what wants results no matter what, no matter the cost. The how is going to manage the bandwidth and manage the team and not put it at the absolute mercy of the what. The big central thing about the livable law method is that it decouples those two roles, the scrum master and the matter owner, the, the ruler of the how and the ruler of the what so that you can serve the client, but you also have someone who's there to protect the team. That is what was missing in the practice of law, and that is what I tried to give by creating this method. I mentioned that each individual is going to have four items they're gonna report on. They get 90 seconds total to report on these four items. They're going to tell you what they have done since the last meeting, which is what they've done in the last 24 hours. And if you have somebody with a task matrix open, they can start deleting things that have been done. And this is how you keep your task matrix clean. 
and then you will have them report what they will do in the next 24 hours. Now, it is not practical for the scrum master to be writing up those items as they're being shared, but it would be good for the scrum master to have the task matrix open and to look at it and say, hey, thanks for reporting on that. Be sure to add it to the task matrix. And in fact, when you are implementing the scrum, a very good thing to do is to tell people, hey, before the meeting, jump into the task matrix and write down the things you're going to report to us anyway in the task matrix. This is how you're starting to interlock these two tools so that they become a method, a standard method for people to communicate to each other. The next two things the team member is going to share is this. They're going to share their stucks, which is anything that they are unable to move forward on because they are stuck. Now, a good one, although it's going to be awkward at first, is if a person can say, hey, I was supposed to be working on the revisions to this brief and I haven't gotten it back from so-and-so, can you please provide it to me? And it is up to the scrum master to be like, oh, yep, yeah, we need to make sure that we update the test matrix. We need to make sure that we change the deadlines. Like there is something we're going to have to be doing about this issue because somebody is stuck. Other stucks can be something like, I don't know where our list of experts is, or this person's not returning my call, or the client won't provide me this document, stuff that has a stuck. And here's the cardinal rule about stucks. If it takes more than 30 seconds to unstuck a person, then it goes to post scrum. You do not spend more than 30 seconds on that because you're going to get bogged down and you're going to use up the 15 minutes and not everybody's going to get their 90 seconds, right? Stucks are rapid fire. Like, hey, I don't know where to find this list. Somebody on the call says, no problem. I'll send it to you. I know where it is. Somebody else says, hey, this person's not answering me. Like, I keep calling this number. Oh, I got an email you can use instead. Those are the stucks that you can go boom, 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 boom. You're using each other as a team to help each other. And that's a fantastic way to create teamwork. And then finally, you have your asks. And your asks are how you assign work to other people. Isn't that great? Instead of having to catch flurrying emails at you coming from a bunch of partners and associates and paralegals and everybody's asking you for stuff and your inbox is a mess. No, this happens during the asks. You can say, hey, so-and-so, can you get me a draft of that? Great. And then I need this done and then I need that done and then I need the other done. And you do that, boom, 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 boom. And then the beauty of this is either, either the asinore or the assignee can be like, okay, you know what? I'll add those to the task matrix. And that way your task matrix gets populated as you're going through your asks or before, actually before would be better or right after. But the point is that everybody has an opportunity to get together and say, for example, if I say, hey, so, so can you do that draft for me? Someone else can be like, well, hold on. Uh, I have something that you can use, like a template that we could be using and say, great, can you pass it over? That's fine. Or even this happens. Somebody says, I need this draft done. Can you do it? And then somebody else says, a uh, partner actually already assigned it to me. Now that would be grotesque because if you were using a task matrix, that wouldn't happen. But the reality is that you're going to have some growing pains. And so this is a way to catch it. The other fantastic thing about the scrum, about being able to share those four things, is that the people who are in charge, as well as the people who are doing the work, get perfect situational awareness of what everybody else is working on. It increases transparency. And that's a fantastic, beautiful thing that we really need in this profession. Let's talk a little bit more about done and to do. You may have someone who comes up and at the meeting says, oh, I, I, I did a bunch. I did a lot. I just did a lot of stuff. Laugh, but that's an actual, actual thing that happened. When that happens, there's going to have to be a conversation after, after the scrum in private about being able to keep track of the work that that person is doing. Because that is a sign of overwhelm and disorganization. And that overwhelm and disorganization is not only going to impact that person, which is a problem, but also the people around them. So duns really have to be what are specifically the things I have done in the last 24 hours. 
we had a chronically underperforming individual. And at the scrums, they were unable to report on what they had done in the last 24 hours. Or they would report really vaguely. Well, I worked on this matter. I worked on that matter. Uh, well, I had a couple phone calls. The good thing about the scrum is that it creates transparency about people's performance. And that is actually a very important issue. And it's actually a gender and racial equity issue. Because if there is transparency about who is doing what, then it'll make it easier for people to be adequately compensated when they are the high performance, when they are delivering work, when they are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Now you can also have the opposite problem. You'll have somebody who comes in and gives you a list of 250 things that they've done in the last 24 hours. Now either they're breaking down the task into minute little pieces that don't have to be like that and you have to tell them, hey, we only have 90 seconds. You gotta summarize, right? You don't tell me that you wrote a brief and then you wrote the uh, you know, and, you know, exhibit to the brief. And then you did a calculation that you also attached to the brief. Like, I don't need to know that you drafted the brief. That's, that's the task. Um, but you definitely want to make sure that people are not padding what they're doing to make it look like they're busier than they are. To do's. To do's really have to be the things that they're going to do in the next 24 hours. And that's actually really hard for people to do. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, when you get into the habit of it, when you get good at this technique, it is actually an incredibly liberating uh, mechanism because you can literally look down and be like, okay, I have a massive list of stuff I need to be doing, but in the next 24, I'm going to do these three or these four or these five. The thing to watch out for is that sometimes people will start listing off 250 tasks that are going to do in the next 24 hours. And I have actually learned they're not trying to pull the wool over anybody's eyes. No. What's actually happening is that they're overwhelmed and they are not prioritizing. And that's something to talk to them about. That is something to work with them on. In fact, you can do that during the scrum and you can do that in a way that's not embarrassing. They can be like, well, I've gotten to do this and this and that and this and that and that and the other. And you say, okay, all right, let's talk about that. What actually has to be done by tomorrow? And then they'll tell you like, okay, well then everything else gets pushed to the day after and we will reconvene. Okay. And you can probably do that in about 30 seconds, knock it out and be done. If this person truly can't get themselves, I don't know. I don't know what has to be done by tomorrow. I don't know. That's okay. I say, you know what? That's fine. We're going to talk about it in post scrum, but this is a really good way to identify, diagnose and address overwhelm and lack of prioritization. It also helps to avoid um, them not working on something that is actually critical for somebody else in the team, right? So it, it all feeds into each other, into creating efficiency and transparency. Let's talk a little bit more about stucks and asks. Sharing stucks is a very effective way to avoid this scenario. When I first started managing an office, I would have weekly meetings. And unfortunately, sometimes, often, this would happen. One particular person would be like, oh yeah, I was waiting on something. And so no progress would be made on that task. It would just kind of fall to the background because they were stuck. But there was no mechanism or vehicle for them to be able to say, hey, I'm stuck. Hey, I'm stuck. Hey, I'm stuck on a daily basis. And they also don't want to be annoying. They don't want to pepper someone with emails. They don't want to do overwhelm of information, right? You don't want to receive an email every two minutes from someone that they're stuck. So the fact that you're creating this space avoids that scenario. The other thing that it does is that it normalizes people reaching out to other folks in the team for help. And that builds morale and it builds a sense of community within your firm and it stops the isolation that is really toxic for us. Asks. One thing that was really frustrating for me was that the way tasks were assigned was that someone would send you an email or be like, come see me. And then they would give you a task. And then this task just existed in your head and their head. But the when and how they asked that you to complete that task was completely random. What if I was in the middle of a really important um, project and then I get pulled away for an hour to go talk about something and now I have that and the other thing to do. And also what would bother me is that somebody, for example, 
would be clobbered with asks from like the partner and the associate and the thing. And this would really happen to overperforming paralegals. This is where I would see it most. And then nobody else would know that they've been asked to do 22 things. Being able to get in there and have these asks done in a public way takes away that to a certain degree. And it also streamlines where people are getting their asks from, right? It's not somebody's text message, somebody's in a chat, somebody's asking them on the email, somebody's asking them in the hallway. Like there is a time and a place for someone to give you assignments. And it helps to lower the mental burden of having to catch assignments wherever they may arrive. Which brings me to light versus heavy load. Okay, we've gone over the task matrix. We've gone over the scrum. You now have a centralized task management system and you have a daily 15 minute meeting to chat about uh, what's going on, right? Done, to do, asks, stucks. What do you do with all this information? Well, for starters, you can actually take a look at your task matrix and you can listen at the scrum meetings and realize if someone is running light or heavy. And that is really something that doesn't happen. What do you, and what do you do about it once you figure it out? You reassign. If somebody is running heavy, you take it upon yourself as the scrum master to say, that's too much. We need to start moving around. And then you find someone who's running light and you say, okay, well, what of that load can you take over? And if the answer is nothing, then you've got a personnel shortage issue or you have a misassignment of personnel because it means that you have somebody who cannot take on load and somebody who is overwhelmed. And also the other thing you wanna look at when you're looking at light versus heavy load is that you wanna start noticing who tends to always run light and who always tends to run heavy. Okay, because the people who run heavy, especially in the practice of law, yours truly, guilty, me, what do we do? We just keep taking on more work because we're overperformers. We can do it all, no problem, until we burn out or leave the law. So truly understanding if someone has a light and heavy load seems like just such a simple banal thing, but it isn't. And now you have the tools to actually check that. Which brings me to substance and difficulty of work. It really goes unnoticed that certain work might be more intellectually demanding and other work might just be plain laborious. And just because something is not intellectually demanding does not mean it is not time consuming. And that's been a very difficult conversation I've had with partners over the years. The fact that when they tell a paralegal, this was a true story, a paralegal needed to put together hundreds of exhibits five different sets of those hundreds of exhibits. And the partner was irritated that it took more than two days. And then he answered, but making binders is easy. And I thought, yeah, making binders is easy. Making 40 binders to all look identical to the five sets they're supposed to mirror is a lot of work. It's not complicated, but it is time consuming and it needs focus because you can't get it wrong. So those are the kind of things that the scrum master needs to be knowledgeable enough, needs to have enough experience to be able to look and understand. If somebody is drafting discovery requests, that is somewhat time consuming, depending on the request. If somebody is doing your discovery responses, that is wildly more time consuming. Those are two different worlds. You can't treat them the same. And I've seen people, partners, try to treat them equally. When the scrum master and you, as the person taking this course, is looking at the task matrix, keep in mind that there is light versus heavy load and that the substance and difficulty of the work is not necessarily proportional to how much time it takes. And what you're looking at with the task matrix is how much time it's going to take. Because here's the thing. This is a fundamental livable law principle. The work week is finite. I'm gonna say that again. The work week is finite. What you are working with 
our working hours. If you are truly committed to making people's lives better, to making the practice of law more livable, to uncrushing your practice, a fundamental concept is that the work week is finite. It starts at a certain day on a certain hour and it ends at a certain time on a certain day, usually Friday. And outside of that, your team needs to be done with you and you need to be done with the work. All of this can happen if you keep in mind all of the things that we've spoken about so far. 